Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. For the past three years, they have been filming a documentary about heritage breed animals entitled The Holstein Dilemma, Heritage Breeds, and the Need for Biodiversity. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, I'm Alara. Our next podcast interview is one that still amazes me. It took me a little bit to get my brain wrapped around the thought that I was in such an August presence. I was very nervous. The process of researching a documentary film is pretty research intensive, and we have definitely done our fair share of that. To find the people who might have something in to contribute that's important, we've delved into the internet for hours on end and traveled to fairs and seminars, spoken with government officials, and we've called and coordinated and emailed and arrived on the doorstep of anyone who we thought would have something that we would like to include in this really important arena. We've been very polite, but we've been pretty shameless about it. Now, we need to mention one of the organizations that's been incredibly helpful for us in learning about heritage breeds. And this great resource is the Livestock Conservancy. It's a nonprofit group based in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Their mission, as it says on their website, is to protect endangered livestock and poultry breeds from extinction, and that's what they do. They've been working toward this goal with scientists, farmers, and influencers since the 1970s, whether or not the public has been aware of it. The Conservancy works with some pretty prominent scientists in the field, ha ha ha, but there's also public figures that believe in the necessity to save heritage breeds and bring attention to them. Some of them have coordinated with the Livestock Conservancy to see what they might do to help bring awareness to this really critical topic, and our next interview is one of those people. We want to thank the Conservancy for the very kind introduction to it. Our guest is known for success in different areas, and the things you might mentally affiliate her with depend on your age and your interest area. She's known by some as an actress with quite a prominent resume in film and stage, including an Independent Spirit Award and nominations for both a Golden Globe and an Emmy, among other things. She's quite well known as an activist, and she's dedicated quite a bit of her time in helping to bring attention to causes such as wildlife preservation and film preservation, training guide dogs for the blind, the historical and various park conservancy programs, especially in New York. And she's a national ambassador for the U.S. Fund for UNICEF. Bringing awareness to the need for heritage breed conservation is also now on the list as a concept that she passionately supports. She's known by many for her compelling looks, and her face represents beauty for an extremely prominent cosmetics company. She's also the host and creator of a truly clever short film series. The first one is called Green Porno, I'm not making that up, and the second is called Mamas. You can find them with a quick web search, and they are definitely worth a look or three. She acts out the mating rituals and motherhood behavior of various animals like bees, hamsters, snails, spiders, and worms in a really funny and fascinating way. She's also known as an author, and she's recently written a book entitled My Chickens and I, which of course I purchased and I begged her to sign, and she very graciously did. This book is a true reflection of her intellect, I believe. Uh, it illustrates some rather complex concepts in an easily approachable and really entertaining way. And as a fellow chicken keeper, I found it spot on. This short films and the chicken book arise, I believe, out of her love of the study of life in all of its complexity and quirkiness. She recently went back to school and now has her master's degree in animal behavior. I guess it's also worth mentioning, if you haven't guessed it by now, that she is also known as the daughter of two very famous people in film history, actress Ingrid Bergman and director Roberto Rossellini. She's physically beautiful, very witty, and obviously a talented actress. She's gracious, animated, approachable, and obviously a person who will never bore those around her. With all of the above rather intimidating facts in my head going into this interview, 
It was very much a surprise to me that the things I found most attractive about her were her sense of humor and her brain. Her thought processes are absolutely fascinating. So with no further ado, here is our very memorable interview on the Long Island Organic Farm of scientist Isabella Rossellini. My name is Isabella Rossellini, and I'm Italian, but I've lived in America since the age of 18. And uh, I lived in New York City. I'm an actress, mostly. I'm a filmmaker, too, and a model. But uh, I was always interested in animals, and I always liked the countryside. So I always had a house here in a little community called Belport Brookhaven, two little towns that are very integrated in Long Island, 60 miles from Manhattan. And five years ago, I started this farm. Okay. So tell me where we are. So we are in Long Island. We are an organic farm, the closest to New York. Um, there is uh, the north, so the Long Island uh, splits at the end uh, as two peninsula, and the North Fork is very well known for their vegetable, which has been developed in the last 20 years, and even vineyard. I am before these two peninsula, uh, very close to New York City, about 60 miles. And I've been here, it was my place where I came every weekend for about 40 years. And uh, five years ago, this land was a, a parcel of 40 acres that belonged to the Marist brother. It was a, a priest retreat. And the priest divided the land uh, and sold 30 acres to a developer who obtained the right to build 12 homes right here. But then the developer got discouraged because of the economy and she thought it would take too long to recoup the investment. And she contacted me and said, would you, she's my neighbor. And she said, why don't you buy it? I'm, I'm not a developer, I'm not <laughs> gonna buy it. And then we started to talk and she's a lawyer. And I, you know, and because we're friendly, I mentioned that, oh, I, since I was a little girl, I always dreamt to have a farm. She said, why don't you make a farm of it? I said, I don't know how to make a farm. But then, you know, I met uh, people from foundation. And finally, about six months later, I bought the land. I made an agreement with the Peconic Land Trust, which is a trust that saves a lot of acres in Long Island and help people like me uh, guide them through an incredibly complicated bureaucracy. Because changing something that is owned residential to be built for 12 homes into a farm. It's a lot of paperwork, more than I thought was ever possible. <laughs> and uh, uh, so here we have vegetables. So I, I have about 30 acres, shy of 30 acres. We have three acres that is uh, uh, dedicated to uh, the vegetable here. Um, this season we have um, eggplants. I mean, a tomato just finished. Uh, but see, our eggplants, uh, look, see how they're very different from the things that you can buy at the supermarket. Because the idea is not only to cultivate organic, but to maintain the diversity of seeds. Because the big uh, farms, uh, uh, you know, you go to a supermarket and you buy asparagus, spinach, but one type. No, there's one type of asparagus, one type of spinach. You might have two or three varieties of salad, maybe two varieties of tomatoes, one corn. But of course, uh, it exists many, many, many different varieties. And they haven't been commercialized because uh, maybe they have a shorter sh shelf life, uh, so they don't last so long in the supermarket, or they bruise while transported. So they were not favored by the big industry. But it's very important to keep by the, what is called the biodiversity, the diversity of seeds. You know why? Why? I tell you why. We all have two eyes, one nose, and one mouth, right? But we are all different. Well, that difference, that individual singular differences, they think is the key to the survival of a species. That's Be a very large statement. To it's make. a very large statement, but it's true. It's the diversity and the individuality that creates resistance to a disease. When people were dying of AIDS, there was a group of people that didn't get infected, and they were object of great study. What did they have genetically that was different from the other, that made them unsusceptible to that illness that killed so many? That is true for animal, that is true for vegetable. There are diseases, pathogen that might kill, and we have had that in history where a, 
you know, uh, what was it called in, in Ireland? It came and they killed all the tomatoes. The blight. Uh, the blight killed all the, the, the potatoes. It created famine in Ireland. But if they had different variety of potatoes, they would have not only different individual potato, but also different species, different, um, not species, different uh, uh, heirlooms. Uh, it would be heirlooms is for plant, breeds, uh, um, uh, breeds is for dogs or animal, you use breeds, and for people we use race. So these individual differences create a higher standard of a diversity, and that's why it's so important to maintain biodiversity. You know, there is big banks in Norway, in, in the... The seed vault. The sea vault. Yes. Yeah, the sea vault. Yes. It's all uh, the idea that if there is a massive disaster, we have a variety of seed, and if the world changes for whatever reason, because, you know, a pathogen comes in, we would have something that is resistant. So it's very important to maintain so the diversity. So this is, for example, a long eggplant. Generally, the one that you find, this one is rounder, but it doesn't look anything like the one that you find at the supermarket. Those are white. Look, look how interesting. So um, you've talked about the plant concept yes. here. Tell me how this same concept of biodiversity is important with animals. With animals. So, we d so it's calculated that we have 9 billion chickens a year in, in, in the earth uh, that are killed uh, um, every year to feed us. Uh, but generally, it's one or two type of chickens. And they are chickens that grow very fast. They selected after the war chickens that were particularly fat and grew very, very fast. And one day I received uh, in my farm by mistake six of these chickens that are called broiler. I mean, there is no misunderstanding about what they're meant to. They are meant to be broiled and eaten. And they started to grow like Frankenstein, bigger, bigger, and bigger, and bigger. They were, they were double the size of the other one, and they were very aggressive, and eight, 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 eight. And I just couldn't believe it, you know, that uh, you can manipulate so much within very few decades and create a new chicken. But that chicken has to be killed at seven or eight weeks because his weight would overwhelm his skeleton, and if you let it live, the bones would crack. Yes. He's bred to eat and get fat, and that's they it. Eat and get fat and be killed. Yes. And so the definition of a heritage breed is a breed that has so slow growth, so that you allow a healthy skeleton to be developed and healthy muscle. And they're still a capable of reproducing naturally, because these chickens, they grow very, very fat. They cannot make love. Turkeys they, too. And, and turkeys, turkeys too. Yes. The turkeys that you yes. eat at Thanksgiving, yes. they are artificially inseminated. <laughs> I mean, did you interview the guy that does the job? What kind of a job is that? I don't think How does he do it? I understand that. They get a look of horror on their face. Oh, yeah, I bet. I mean, where do they go? They go like, I don't know. I, I'm doing a gesture like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, because they're too fat, and so the genitals are cannot meet. Yeah. Because they are so, and, and also you breed them against, uh, ra you know, for example, a chicken goes into a state like Sleeping Beauty. It's called uh, brooding. They sit on the eggs. You could tell that they are in a state of enchantment and they are keeping the eggs warm for 21 days. They roll them beneath them. They're listening because the babies inside the eggs peck and so they make noises and the mama eats them, uh, talks to them. So they're also selected not to go broody. Yes. So these chickens that are modern, even if they have eggs, they don't know what to do with them. They don't, they don't get into that uh, sleeping beauty state where they sit for 21 days because they've been selected. And by selected, it means uh, um, it would be like uh, they noticed that one chicken was brooding less than another. And so they had that one have uh, sons and daughters. And then they made those. And you select that trait. So within a few generations, that trait becomes a dominant trait. I, you know, we got to talk to Kerry Fowler, the gentleman yes. that did the seed bank yes. in Norway. And one thing that he said really changed my perspective. I asked him if GMOs were effective to help feed the world today, you know, genetically yeah. modified organisms. And he said, we've been genetically modifying organisms for hundreds, for and, hundred hundreds years. and hundreds uh, yes. of years. We just do it slowly. Slowly. But you do it, quickly. yes. If you do it slowly, though, and you're seeing there is a mistake, you can slowly correct it. Yes. 
The only thing with uh, genetically modified is that you, you intervene so fast and you may not think of all the ramifications. You might just think, okay, I need uh, a salmon that is much bigger than the natural salmon because people like to eat salmon. So genetically, just select, modify, put a gene that makes them bigger so we eat more salmon. But you don't know what happened. Five years later, the chickens that they developed to grow quickly developed woody breast, and all of a sudden they tasted terrible. But then we have to back up five years. I think that happened to the pigs. That's, that's why I think, yes, that happens too. So that's why our little farms, I mean, besides the bank in Norway with the seeds or maybe other places, that there is a role that they play. Not only and this incredible contribution to the community. I cannot tell you how many children, people come here, they enjoy it. Children don't know anymore that eggs come from chicken, carrots, plant look like this, this is the season. So this is an incredible gift to, to, uh, to our community and, uh, and uh, the politician that uh, helped me uh, modify my zoning. We're right when they say, the biggest, we want this farming because there is an incredible benefit uh, for the community and it creates a richness and a desire of people to move in. And, and self-sufficiency in and, a way. Yes, a we, we do have a farmer's a market, but I think scientifically we're also very good into having her historical breed, yes. heritage breed of yes. chicken, heritage breed of seed. And children understand it. That is the vegetable garden. It's completely overgrown because now it's September, October, and the school just started. So in the summer, but the school, there is a uh, high school right here, and they keep a vegetable garden that mimics what Patty does. But they see my chickens. Come see them because they're very cute. Do you know what we're going to do? I think they're big enough and so we can let a few out because i you know they are they're dying to get out um but i don't i don't let so these are very rare chickens historical chickens so come on guys right there? Is that what I'm do saying? you that this is this is a crevice cur i'm going to catch it um this one come on girl oh oh my goodness oh my goodness oh my goodness. this is a crevice cur this is critically endangered um i'm going to put my glasses here this is a critically endangered uh, animal um, from, uh, uh, there are maybe 500 left in the world. There are very few left. They're trying to bring it back. It was very popular for both eggs and meat. So these chickens are 10 weeks old. Look, they, are, they are very small, considering that the chickens that we buy at the supermarket is only uh, uh, seven weeks old. The, this the is a breed, come on girl. The, they're the yes. table bird, right? The, the France is yes, the, in taste. France. Uh, yes, the, the crevicure. This one is it's mar. It's not. I forgot the name. They are from Sweden, and uh -huh. they should be able to. They they are laying eggs that are darker green. I can't wait. They're That's still, not a they have, bar. No. Yes, yes, is it, it is. Bar? Yes. Then this one, I haven't understood what it is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is that your, is that your free mystery oh, chick from are you, Murray are you, uh, No, no, this one is, uh, ah yes, it does come from Murray McMurray. So I was told that if you look at the feathers, if they're pointy, it's a male. I have a feeling it's a male, uh, just because it's so much bigger. I generally try to buy only female and, and, uh, and don't have any rooster because I don't want to breed them. But uh, it's only guaranteed 99%, so there's always a rooster. They call it chicken math, where you yeah. figure out how many chickens you need to end up with the chickens you want. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so he's got it big could. Legs, he, he, got, he has big legs. Yeah. He has a pointy, a little bit of a pointy feather. This tail, hmm, suspicious to me. Egg guy. I don't know what it is, though. Let me see. This one is something. See what I mean? She's, she seems a little bit smaller. Yes. Okay, wait, wait, wait. And a little less, what we might say, masculine somehow, though I don't know what yeah, that see, means. Yeah, see, maybe, I don't know, the feathers of the female that should be a little bit rounder. Yes. It's hard for me to yeah. tell. I think they are a little bit, so I think, it's, and it's also slightly smaller, but I don't know what breed is this. Five this one, I'm not knowing it's a Lakelander. Oh, oh, my God, oh, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, come on. She's beautiful, isn't she? Yeah. So these are all endangered. The most endangered, look at this one. This one is not endangered, but it's a historical bridge. It's called a, a Polish. And um, I think they came out of, uh, look at the hairdo. I mean, amazing. And let, look at the beauty of the feathers. Yes. Uh, the beautiful color, isn't it? Uh, yes. It looks like a drawing. 
I have so, chickens at home and I have I to have? stop myself in molting season from collecting them if all because they're so pretty. Look how beautiful the feathers. Yes. Hey girls, throw your feathers. Okay, come on down. Okay. <laughs> so you see, they, they, I'm going to put a few, in, a few inside because this is the first time they go out. But I don't want them to let them out because the crows are here and hawks are here. And I want... <laughs> so now I, you are well known as as a model Why'd and beauty that and that's the association <laughs> but your mind is very interesting to me you're into animal behavior and yes. you're studying animal behavior so when you're talking about this yeah. you're not talking out of your ear you no, actually no, have I some know. education so what happened yes i was a model but you know the, and and i'm still an actress but you don't model any i mean they don't hire you after 35 anymore and same <laughs> acting you know you might work until 40, 45, then it dwindles off. And then there is less work. But I was always interested in animal behavior. You know, I grew up watching the National Geographic. Jane Goodall was made me dream. And so I went back to university. Uh, they opened uh, at Hunter College the animal behavior. And I, New York is only 60 miles. And I enrolled and I have a master's degree on animal behavior <laughs> and conservation. And then I started making these funny films. Uh, uh, about animals and and then also have them right here at my farm. Look how beautiful this one is. This one I bet is a cuchin. Let me try to... You I, did girl, a, a few series sorry? on animal behavior. One on uh, the mamas, on mothering yes. and maternal instinct and another one on animal sex called... Yes, green, green porn. <laughs> green porn. Then I did another one called Seduce Me about all the courtship. Yes. Which is quite interesting. I mean uh, you know, even when you look at the, uh, at the chicken and the, the rooster is much bigger than, uh, than the female chicken, and that's called demorphism. And that means that the two sexes are different in shape. And that tells you that the male fight, so they have a different his evolutionary history. They fight, so they push their evolution to grow bigger and stronger. Yeah. And so the male are in the turkey, or we'll see the turkey, uh, the males are much bigger than the female, and you will know that the male fight for to conquer the female. And now, in my chickens at home, I, I, I got a feeling you're a male. I don't know. That tail makes me makes me suspicious. And there's the active forager over there on the other side of the fence. Yeah, how eating, eating, eating. But where did they go? I mean, I was looking at them because you know there is a fence here. What kind of animals you have here? So it took me a while. I, I wanted animals because I also went back to university to study animal behavior and I loved animals and I wanted to have animals. But I was wondering what would make sense? What kind of animal do I have? And when Patty, uh, the farmer, started to grow different heirlooms of uh, uh, tomatoes, of asparagus, of spinach, and I found out that there were some in dangerous breed of farm animal. I was unaware of it. And I became aware of it just on the looking at the site of a livestock conservancy that explained so well that with industrial farming, you lost a lot of breeds. We just eat one type of chickens. We have eggs for maybe two breeds of chickens. But there are many breeds, like we have many breeds of dogs. We have a Pekingese, a Maltese, a Bulldog, a Dachshund. It's like if all of them will go and we just concentrate on Labrador and Dachshund, that's what we need, and all the rest would go. But you lose a lot of biodiversity and a lot of talent. You might be losing herding dog, hunting dog, and these kind of talents. So that intrigued me, and I thought, oh, maybe there is a role that a small farm could play in maintaining biodiversity. And so since then, I've been starting uh, just having heritage breeds of chickens, and I have about 20 different breeds. Then we went to see the pig. Not wandering, he's taking a bath. That's Boris. What kind of pig is Boris? He, Boris is a kunikuni. He's a male, that's why he has this... Uh, hi, that's his word, is he hiding me, hi. That is a male, that's why he has this task. Oh, hi, boy, Where's the, where is the other one? Is this the New Zealand pig? Yes, ah. it is one is the, this one is the New Zealand pig. Sir. And this would be a very perfect land. You see, there's a lot of wood uh, and we have a lot of acorn. It would be oh. a perfect land uh, to have pigs. But the reason why I don't have them is that this, we don't have a good slaughterhouse and I'm very, um, Attentive to animal welfare, I'm, I'm not a vegetarian, and I think that we, 
uh, we can eat. You know, I don't, I'm not, I don't have anything against carnivores, but I do think we have to treat them well. And even when we slaughter, that has to be humanely done and it yes. shouldn't be painful. And the, 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 most slaughterhouse kill the animal very fast, but it's a transportation that is very stressful to them. Look, snoring in a pond under the leaves, and then all of a sudden he's in a truck full of other pigs he doesn't know, bouncing, noises. He would be so traumatized, and he would have to go for maybe 12 hours, then yes. be put on a pen waiting for his turn to be killed. That's what is stressful. And, uh, and that's why I decided against having pigs, unless we have a good slaughterhouse um, nearby or a mobile slaughterhouse that would come here. So now he's six years old. It will be too old to be eaten. It will be like <laughs> eating my shoe. So here he is. It, it was me, teaching me a lesson. I was very naive too about Oh, see, the chicken came out finally. She has turkeys on the farm too. I'm delighted because turkey is a, a wild uh, indigenous uh, bird of uh, America. So it's great. I would like to raise more turkeys. Um, they lay some eggs, which are delicious. They don't lay as many eggs as the chickens. They haven't been, they haven't gone through the selection uh, process that the chickens have had. So they do lay eggs, but not as, not five, six a week. Um, but turkeys require a little bit more space and than they, chickens. And so they fight, to... yeah, that's, uh, yeah. they do fight. Well, I think there would be enough space here for all of them to move. It's funny because they would be here, but today, I don't know, maybe... Oh, these my bees are there. You want to see them? I would love to see your bees. I used to have... In many ways, heritage breeds are susceptible not only to, um, to our breeding, but, you know, a typhoon or a hurricane or war comes in. This little teeny breeding supply can be vastly changed very quickly. Yes. So if people say, oh, well, there's plenty of them. Look at the Crevy Cur. I mean, it's a good example. The Crevy Cur uh, died because they lived regionally. The breeds generally start by being grown in, in regionally. So regionally, they grew, they grew in this uh, region called Crevy Cur in Normandy. And that's where the heavy fighting in the Second World War happened. Mm. So they were decimated. and. Uh, then they didn't bring back that breed, probably industrial farm mills. You know, there was a, a big different way of life that settled in in Europe after the war. Yes. It was more industrial, it was richer. The population, the human population exploded. I mean, when I was born in 1952, there were two billion people on this planet, wow. and now there are nine. I think this is the biggest change uh, in my life, you know, that uh, uh, already when I was growing up, we were, I was told that yeah, the planet has never been so many people. We're overpopulated. What about now? Yes. <laughs> Nine billion. It's a whole discourse we have all yes. the time and we grew up with. <laughs> yes, but if, if a good chunk of your life is, is social interaction around food, it should be good food. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I love it, yeah. you know. But I have to say, I, 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 like, I like the farm, but I like, uh, I like being at the farm and, and these... Uh, to witness, you know, to the animal, the beekeeping, being with Patty, understanding her problem, and the problem solving. How do you maintain this? Because it's not only good food, but it's also biodiversity. It's also an incredible gift to the community, especially mothers and babies. This has become like a playground. You know, a lot of them come and they all express their gratitude and the children love it. So how do you maintain all this? Because it's a way of life. And, and uh, it's, it's hard. It, you know, if I weren't an actress making my money in another industry, I don't think I could afford farming. Yeah. And, and my now next goal is to try to create this farm. Maybe you never make money at the farm, but to create it, to make it financially viable so that it doesn't depend on my acting because one day I will not act or day, when there will be a day when I'm dead. So that's my last years of my life, I want to dedicate them to how to create this as a place that it is, uh, self, can self-sustain. I don't think we can ever make money selling eggs, even if my eggs are more expensive than the eggs you buy at the supermarket or patty vegetable are more expensive than the regular industrial food because, of course, it, 
the industrial food is always also done with intent to bring the price down. And we don't bring the price up, that's not our intention, but it's a lot of labor intensity that yeah. the industry doesn't have. It's, it's very difficult to make a living in farming, yeah. and I think, for the accountant in me, I think that the bottom line has to have another consideration in there. What is my quality of life? It's a quality if of I life. work really but hard you know, to go buy sense, things. This, in this sense, I didn't see much difference between farming and artists. Artists are people that know that they may not make, if you want to make money, you become an accountant. Though you don't look terribly rich to me. I'm no, I'm doing a documentary, <laughs> so I'm not. No, I'm afraid there there went that. But you know, if you want to be rich, you you go to Wall Street, you go to banking. Yes. You know, if you want to make money. But an artist knows that there is a high risk of being an artist that you will not make money. You just hope to make enough money to live the life you want to live. And I saw that with Patty and the other farmers. They don't expect to become rich and make so much money, but enough money to live the life they want to live, which is to come every day out in the field, to be in nature. And that also, it's incredible. And uh, it's, a, it's a complete different point of view. You know, we are told at school, you earn your money, and then when you have a lot of money, you can buy your lifestyle. But artists always knew that there is a shortcut, that you're not rich, you'll not be able to take a, you know, every six months a trip to France. Asia or buy jewelry but you can do your art uh, yes. because that's what your love is and yes. your passion is yes. and that's true for swamp farm farmer yeah. so I, I, I didn't and when I start farming I there was I totally understood it, there was this affinity that's what we we're finding that many of the farmers many of the farmers that we've interviewed are people that are retired and coming back to something now that the economics of it are not as critical. They're coming back to, yes. to their roots and something that's wholesome and meaningful. But many of farmers are 60, 70, 80 years old and this is their second life and there's something rich about it. Yeah. Well, that was it for me too. I mean, I came back to animal behavior studies when I retired or, I, I, you know, I didn't work so much as a model as an actress and then started to farm because I had time, yeah. yeah. And it's a very interesting way uh, to, to retire or, or being old. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. We want to thank Isabella Rossellini for having us at her farm today. We'd also like to thank the Livestock Conservancy. For more information about heritage breed animals, please visit the Livestock Conservancy at livestockconservancy.org or at their Facebook page. Please join us next week when we interview Uji McGuire at her farm, Desert Weir, in Peonia, Colorado. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. We'd also like to thank our producer, Michelle Council. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.